Hi, everyone. Welcome to AI Talk, a Zoom show about AI technology and life. I'm your host, Karen Howe, and we are here today for our very last of five pilot episodes, and actually, in fact, the very last AI Talk episode ever. It's been an incredibly fun run, um, but I think five seems like a magic number. So thank you so much for joining us this final time. Um, as always, this episode features an incredible guest speaker and a conversation about their work and their life. This is not an MIT technology review show, so you'll notice that the production might be a little bit glitchy and unpolished at times. I'll still be sending out a survey after this episode to collect your feedback, so if you have any last words about the show, this is your final chance. A note about Zoom bombing. Um, we've done what we can on our end to prevent that from happening, but if it does, we'll end the show immediately and Sam and I will record the episode separately and then follow up with a recording of that in uh, your emails. So thank you so much for being willing to experiment with us and hopefully you had some fun in the process. So with that, I'm super excited to introduce our very last guest for AI Talk. Sam Gregory is the program director at the nonprofit Witness, which helps activists around the world use video to document human rights abuses. He's also a big fan of Europop and the father of two adorable kids, which is why his walk on music, as you heard, was a rendition of Robin's Call Your Girlfriend, um, but for learning the names of dinosaurs. Um, Sam is truly a global citizen and he, he grew up in Sweden, the UK, the US. He once spoke fluent um, Nepali, and he now leads advocacy campaigns worldwide, particularly in Latin America and Asia. He's also just a really nice human. So Sam, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show. Thanks, Karen, I'm delighted to be here. So, um, I've gotten to know you through the incredible work that you do on deepfakes, and you're like my go-to person on whenever I have like anything, uh, any commentary that I need about this particular issue, but, um, deepfakes AI synthetic media is not actually witnesses focus. It's just something that has become deeply intertwined in your work. So for our audience here today, can you give a brief overview of what witness is and what it does? Sure. Um, and again, I should apologize for that totally uh, bastardized version of the Robin song. For anyone who actually likes that song, having it sung by like tinny nine year olds may not be your, uh, your favorite idea of fun. Um, so, so Witness, we've been around 30 years and we were founded uh, after the Rodney King incident, which was an incident of police violence in the US that took place um, in the early 1990s. And what was notable about it was that a citizen filmed it with their camera. Um, and so for the last 30 years, what we've explored is how do you make it possible for as many people who are filming human rights violations as people who choose to spend their lives doing that or an accidental witness to something that that footage makes a difference. Um, and so we work worldwide with communities of activists, uh, journalists, uh, ordinary community members who document police violence and war crimes and land rights issues. And of course, over time, that's meant that we also have to deal with people who wanna document truth and people who want to perpetuate falsehoods. Um, and so you get this sort of intertwined challenge of how do we protect the good in these social media ecosystems with how do we counter the threats of people who want to share media manipulation or falsehood. And that's the connection to the deep fakes is, you know, for about the last 10 years, we've started to see many people sharing shallow fakes. So, you know, miscontextualized videos, lightly edited videos. And then of course, we're starting to see this emerging thread of deep fakes. And um, that's the reason we started to get involved with it, is we care about the truth in audio visual material. And if you want to deal with truth, you have to think about how people create lies. Can you bring us back to the first moment that you started hearing about deepfakes and um, whether it was from, or, or and, and also if it's a separate instance, the first moment that it actually started affecting your work and the people that you work with? Yeah, so it, it was a number of things. It was, um, you know, I, I, the amazing reporting actually by reporters like Sam Cole at Vice, who are looking at um, non-consensual sexual images, which is still the main space where deepfakes happen you know, targeting ordinary women, celebrities, and journalists, and swapping their faces into non-consensual sexual images. Um, and Sam's been just one of those amazing people who really followed it right from when it was just, you know, looking at GitHub repos where people had started to post the code. Um, it was also listening to people, and I'm often just listening to people who are thinking on the outside edge of tech. So uh, Tim Huang, um, who's in the AI space, who uh, organized the first sort of computer vision type meeting around this, very early on trying to understand that um, and has tremendous judgment for seeing far ahead in these spaces. 
Um, but in the real human rights space, um, you know, I think the really notable thing that um, that highlighted it was um, first hearing about Rana Ayub's case um, mm -hmm. in India. Rana Ayub, very prominent Indian journalist, who uh, found herself morphed into a series of sexual content targeting her after she had um, documented and spoken out about um, uh, right-wing violence in India and uh, been a consistent voice in opposing that. Um, and then the other thing is we looked at it, uh, and this has been you know, really how I've thought about deepfakes is, it seems such of a continuity with the patterns of um, ways people have challenged uh, media in the past. So when I read about Rana Ayub's case, I think about similar things that have happened to other people um, we've worked with or know. So, you know, Marielle Franco, a city councilwoman who was murdered in Brazil, um, after her death, people photoshopped her face into images um, trying to implicate her in gang violence or mm -hmm. um, sexual conduct. And, you know, constantly in the last 20 years of my work with video, people have tried to claim that the video shot by citizen journalists or by people who witness war crimes is fake. Mm -hmm. um, so when you see deep fakes, you look at it, I look at it through the lens of, you know, a decade of feeling weary about people trying to do that in the world of UGC. Um, and so that, that was sort of the warning signal is li listening to a pioneering journalist describing their own experiences and then the research coming out of people who I think were very forward thinking in the journalism and tech community. One thing that's um, really struck me the most in the conversations that I've had with you is that the threat of deep fakes isn't just about um, challenging or it's not just about making fake things seem real. It's actually one of the even harder threats to combat is the existence of the technology can allow people to challenge real things as fake. And so you, you mentioned that this was something that you had already started encountering last year in your work when you were in Brazil working with activists there where they were starting to um, come across this where people were questioning the evidence that they had could you talk a little bit about like what that process has been like and how it plays out on the ground? Yeah, so it's, it's been really interesting. So for the last year, um, we spent about two years working on deepfakes and the last year we've really prioritized as one part of our work, making sure it's a conversation that is global and that's driven by from the margins. Um, so not by Silicon Valley, not by DC, not by Brussels. And so as part of that, we held this series of meetings in Brazil last year and then since then, one in Southern Africa and one in Malaysia that was many people from Southeast Asia. Um, and it's really consistent what people describe as threats. And it's very grounded in things they experience already. So one threat that people describe is already people claim that when you have a piece of citizen media, uh, that, it's, that it's falsified. Um, so uh, in Brazil, that a piece of police violence was, uh, if you film police violence in a favela, that you staged it or that it was falsified. Um, an activist from Uganda in the meeting we held in South Africa said, you know, um, police violence against students during a student protest. Uh, they released a doctored version that showed a uh, claim to implicate the students in the violence. Uh, and when you look at, um, say, someone like Burma, um, activists in Burma talked about how the government had, in fact, staged photos of people from the Rohingya population in the north burning their own homes. So they'd literally got actors to do this. And then actually the spokesperson of the de facto prime minister of Burma had tweeted this, these images out. So they already see this pattern of people staging images, editing images. Mm -hmm. And they also see this pattern of, and we've seen it worldwide in the human rights space, of uh, the governments often being part of the, the problem, you know, trying to target and surveil activists and uh, spread rumors. And this is where we get this sort of tight intersection between different tools of surveillance and how you use images and how you use facial recognition and how you might use deep fakes is, these are all tied together by governments targeting dissidents. Um, so we've heard those fears very strongly and very tied to the real world experiences of how this happens already. And I think when we think about deep fakes as tied to existing patterns and threat vectors, uh, we de sort of exoticize them and recognize them as, you know, a way of, of you know, sometimes creating new, new ways of you know, creating harm, but also often it's ways of expanding or reinforcing existing harms. Yeah, I think related to that, I'm curious, I mean, so you mentioned that you have been in this space for 20 years and specifically at Witness for 20 years. And so I imagine you've seen a lot of instances in which technology has disrupted human rights work on the ground. And this is kind of just like the latest incarnation or, or latest thing. Do you think it's actually unique in any way or is it kind of just, it's, more of the same. I think 
we're in it's I, I view it a bit of a piece with a kind of a trend at the moment which is the perception that um, which I think is a dangerous one that social media that a broader access to the ability to create and share our own experiences is a negative thing and I think there's a really strong valence right now that it's it's bad it's it's all this is just a source of misinformation and disinformation and rumors and hate speech and that's really true but it's also true that we're seeing many more opportunities for people to to share their own experiences to expose things that never would have got time in the mainstream media would never have been talked about would never have been documented and it's very imperfect so I look at deep fakes as also as a symptom of that, uh, that they play into this kind of sort of way in which people want to claim that we can't believe anything. Um, mm -hmm. And there are vested power interests that want us not to be able to trust anything but authoritative sources. And we'll actually claim the technologies we build for authority, like the tools for authenticity, the fake news laws, to reinforce their power, not our power. Mm -hmm. um, so I view deep fakes as a symptom they do worry me like i you know and it's funny i run a program at witness called emerging challenges and opportunities mm. and i i sort of joke i wish i could focus more on opportunities now because <laughs> challenges is kind of a depressing space but there is something really fundamental here about like if we can't believe our lying eyes uh that goes against at least the last hundred years of how we've started to think about you know the power of photos and video and you know, I come out of an academic background, so I know all the stuff people talk about. No, it's not actually a truthful representation of reality, et cetera, et cetera. And I know about editing. But there is something different when we're cognitively messing with our process. So when you look at something and it looks like me speaking, it's not me, and you can't tell that, that is pretty challenging when we encounter that in a social media environment or a live stream video environment or in a conversation versus Brad Pitt being de-aged in Benjamin Button, right? Those are very different scenarios. Yeah. Um, so I do view it as pretty important. And I, you know, I view it as fundamental. We push back on that. And we push back on the narrative that everything is fake. But we also recognize there's a real threat here, um, both in people doing it, but also people being able to claim it's happened, right? To go back to what you were saying is like, it's really easy to say, no, that was a fake. And, you know, and then people have to prove it's real. And proving real is really hard. Yeah. Um, versus proving, yeah. in some ways harder than proving fake. Yeah, I, so you actually hosted, um, you co-hosted a workshop last year with the BBC in partnership on AI about how to, how to build trust and how to um, just help combat the just general pervasive um, misinformation. So wh what were some of the things that you discussed in that workshop and what were some of the solutions that you um, came up with? Yeah, so, it's, so this was a really interesting meeting where we brought together a lot of the major media organizations and, um, and technology platforms to really talk about what was needed. And we focused on, I guess, four areas. Uh, one was detection approaches, another was authentication and authenticity. Um, and then we looked at how do you communicate with the public and then how do you coordinate? And mm -hmm. I think what's been interesting is in all those areas, we're seeing a lot of, um, and I'll say this from a witness perspective, because I'm also involved in some of the Partnership on AI expert groups in this, is we're seeing real progress on, on solutions, right? There's a lot of detection work happening, uh, like the deep fakes detection challenge from Facebook, um, data sets being released, lots of research. And there's also movement on the technical side on authenticity. So uh, Adobe and Twitter and the New York Times and the content authenticity initiative. What's important is that those solutions move forward, but they actually listen to the ways in which they will play out when they play out globally. Right. So, you know, the questions that are really important now as we're actually building these things are, you know, as we build detection, who gets access to that? Like, is that going to be something that the New York Times and the BBC get access to and Facebook? But we, you know, we cold shoulder the community media outlet in Rio or um, the national news outlet in Malaysia. Um, and there are real technical reasons why we might restrict access to detection, but there are real socio-political reasons why we have to avoid creating sort of a two-tier world about how we deal with media manipulation. Um, and there's a similar issue with these kind of authenticity standards. So we're part of uh, the working group that's looking at these authenticity infrastructure approaches that Adobe and others are working on. And, and what we're bringing to the table there is saying things like, how are we going to value people who are concerned about privacy and anonymity, who use old devices, who worry about who will get access to all this rich data we might be providing about you know, changes to a piece of media, um, who worry about whether they're going to have to have a persistent identity in order to be trusted. 
and how that might be weaponized against them by the wave of fake news laws that are happening globally. So I, we've seen this real technical advance, and I think some of the, the things that were important were really highlighted in that, that first uh, coordination meeting. The key is now that we make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past, right? Mm -hmm. So many mis and disinformation responses, so many technical solutions are built uh, by the technologists of Silicon Valley, informed by the policy agendas of DC and Brussels, and then create harms everywhere else. Yeah, um, Laura has a question. Is there a video available of that workshop? We didn't do a video of it. We do have a, a basic report out, um, and certainly all the different work that um, the witness has done, we report out on our website. Um, I should also note the Partnership on AI has done some further work on that, and there's actually a project they're leading with a group called First Draft that is about uh, communicating to the public about uh, manipulation. So how do we actually explain this in a way that gets beyond uh, the sort of, it's a deep fake, um, yeah. or it's a shallow fake, or it's miscontextualized, all these things that don't necessarily mean much once you try and explain it to people who are just looking at a piece of media in their feed. Related to the, um, what you mentioned at the end there, which is DC and Brussels are the ones that are kind of dictating policy agendas and then um, it ends up harming people around the world. So that, that was a point that I hadn't really understood before you had mentioned it to me that, um, that a lot of other governments will look to DC and Brussels and kind of copy the regulations that they come up with, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it'll go well for their countries and their context. So could you talk more about that just like the, the global landscape and like how complicated it is? Yeah, so, so you know, even before COVID-19, we had this sort of tendency to think of what we call fake news laws, which were often about, uh, let's give two examples. So Singapore, um, the right of approval of the government to declare the truth or falsehood of a Facebook post, for example, and to have a correction posted or something similar. Um, not coincidentally, um, I don't think, a num the, the first examples where the Singaporean government asked for those corrections were opposition members posting on Facebook. So in theory, it's a measure about challenging like rumors on Facebook and misinformation. In practice, when it's used by a government, it's used you know, across a range of um, ways that might challenge um, your, your authority. Another example would be a country like Tanzania that has registration laws for bloggers, right, where you uh, force people to pay to be have an online presence that has a certain amount of reach. Um, and actually what's happening under COVID-19 is we're seeing a slew of these, um, you know, we're kind of in an accelerated moment about responses to mis and disinformation um, by the platforms, they're doing a ton of stuff, but also by governments. And so much of that is being weaponized against dissidents. Another example of that to go to Europe would be Hungary, where the laws against misinformation, disinformation are directly being used against opposition members. So um, when I look at something like, you know, how do we develop an authenticity infrastructure for media that might say, for example, well, this piece of media was created in this place by this person, hasn't been manipulated. I look ahead to how a government might say, well, actually, if you want to publish uh, on a social media platform in our country, we think it's the right thing that you have a named identity and you tell us where this was shot and you confirm it wasn't, auth wasn't manipulated. And on the face of it, that sounds nice until you think, well, um, who would track who in this scenario? Yeah. Um, and what would they do with that data? So many fake news responses at a infrastructure level or a technical level uh, can play into the ways that legislation may have used those. Yeah, um, we have another question. What role can policymakers play in reducing the ramifications of deep fakes and misinformation? So um, I, I spend, I, I work obviously with a, a broad team at Witness and I should note my colleague Dia Kayali who does a lot of work in the EU context. Um, and I do some work in the Hill, uh, which is for those outside the US is US congressional setting. Um, I actually think deep fakes is a really good example where we've been saying a couple of things. One is actually make sure you don't legislate too early until you understand a phenomenon, right? Deep fakes is not what, they're not widespread outside of non-consensual sexual images. Um, we don't know how they're gonna be weaponized and used. So you have to be really careful. I remember there was actually an anecdote that was shared actually in a deep fakes meeting I was at where someone shared the example of how forward thinking people prepared for that, the advent of aerial warfare at the turn of the century. And he was like, they were very forward thinking and they really planned ahead for how air balloons would be used in aerial warfare and created all these conventions around it. And so they, they basically jumped ahead and were like, air balloon, it's gonna be, it's gonna be at the heart of the problem. 
and, and I think when we look at deep fakes, we have to really understand how it plays out and not legislate too early. That doesn't mean you don't legislate on things like non-consensual sexual images, but it does mean being careful. And then the other thing that we've said in the US context is, you know, it's the duty of every Congress or every government to legislate for their citizens, right? That's who voted for them. But what is done in the US will have implications that go globally. And that's a really tough thing to say is like choices that are made in, in Washington DC will ripple uh, similarly with the EU. And how do you make that really clear? Um, you know, an analogy in that would be my colleague Dia's work um, around terrorist content in the EU, where the EU in a very well-meaning way, I think well-meaning, is trying to control the spread of terrorist and violent extremist content. But the measures they propose, we already see leading to the takedowns of, you know, war crimes evidence in Syria, um, footage gathered by groups like the Syrian Archive and Nemanik that are really painstakingly documenting from spaces like YouTube. And those measures also tend to lead to over takedowns of, of content. Um, mm -hmm. so, so again, that's a well-meaning measure being launched in the EU that will have rippling effects globally. Uh, we have another question. Ooh, wow, a lot of questions. Um, from Jenna, how often do you find yourself having to provide basic information literacy education before you can even approach more complex topics like deep fakes? Yeah, so this is, it's, I was actually just literally sitting writing a research proposal just literally before this. So, um, one of the things we've heard most clearly in, the, um, in all these, these meetings is that people want to deal with existing shallow fakes issues. So they want to be able to talk about miscontextualized videos, lightly edited videos, and they want to be able to explain deep fakes, but they need to do it in a way that might get away actually from the technical explanation, right? So I'm actually not sure how useful it is to tell people that something is manipulated with AI. Does that matter? It's a little bit like we sprinkled it with magic, you know, pixel <laughs> dust, and therefore the face looks different. Now it might be important to understand that AI techniques mean that we're going to have, you know, an adversarial development of improving forgeries, right? That could be relevant to explain. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, you know, someone speaking from working with rural um, communities who've only recently had mobile and internet access in Southeast Asia was like, I don't know if that distinction is useful um, when I'm talking to people. And so I think it's really important we work out how to do this. It's also really important we think about how we popularize a lot of the kind of methodologies that have been developed in like open source intelligence and fact checking and verification that are all these ways of kind of separating truth from, from fiction. But they're kind of technical, they feel professionalized, uh, they don't necessarily have the right language to speak to people. Um, so I think this is a really important area of how we, how, we, how we talk to people about these things in a way that feels human. Um, the one thing we've been saying in the deep fakes area is like, you can't just expect people to spot these things. I think there's a little bit of this tendency that somehow it's gonna be like, you know, just look carefully, like look at Karen's teeth, they're kind of a little bit wobbly or Sam doesn't blink at the right frequency type stuff. That is really not a good tip. It's, it's putting way too much pressure on individuals who look at something in a social media feed. So we do need to look at the responsibility of how technical signals help people make good decisions. That's different from saying technical signals need to lead good decision making about how we understand media. Yeah, um, we are gonna take this one more question and then we're gonna play a game. And we have also an AMA at the end. So pe people should keep dropping questions in for us to address at the end. Um, how can we make sure that the right legislation is drafted and passed, not putting regulation that's actually harmful um, for progress? The congressional hearing with Mr. Zuckerberg and tech companies were showing us that a lot of legislators are lacking the knowledge around AI and future technology. I, th I think there is progress. Like it's, you know, it's a truism that legislators are not up to date. Um, I, I do notice improvement. Like, and so I want to give some credit. Like I was looking at the last hearing. I, I don't watch, I don't often sit down for four hours to watch them, but there was one I watched about three months ago and I did think it had improved. So um, I actually do think the investments in really trying to up speed um, congressional staffers, um, senators is important. Uh, I think we want to be careful around um, the sort of all encompassing kind of like, let's grab all the different bits of AI and tech and deal with them. You know, there's a strong argument we should be thinking about regulation of platforms and that could include deep fakes within it as a category of mis and disinformation. I don't know we need to leap to the, the deep fakes legislation yet. So it's also just, we don't need to bite off everything. Um, and we might want to work out what's actually the underlying issue uh, rather than like the sort of the, the symptom. Um, 
uh, what I think has been good is actually there's, there's quite significant funding being directed by, for example, the US Congress towards research. Um, and I, what I always look at in these spaces is like the number of people who want to build the, the whiz bang tool to create fakes or to create synthetic models, synthetic, you know, Lil Michaela's, whatever, is, is much greater than the detection money. And so actually getting resourcing to, to a diverse set of people investing in detection and that side of it is actually a worthwhile thing. Funds actually matter, um, you know, and money actually matters in terms of resourcing this well and smartly. So speaking of the regulation of platforms, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are going to play a game called Hot or Not, and that means, Sam, you're going to decide whether you approve of something, and this week that thing is Facebook's oversight board. Oh, yikes. I'm also very pleased that I found this photo. <laughs> so thank you to the internet. Um, so Facebook's oversight board, for people who don't know, is meant to be an independent board that can overturn the company's own content moderation decisions. It will govern appeals from Facebook and Instagram users and questions from Facebook itself. The existence of the board is not actually new. Facebook announced it in November of 2018, um, but just as as of this afternoon, the company finally released the first 20 members and says it will eventually have around 40. So here's like, I didn't put the entire list of names, but it's interesting to see the makeup of the people and, and their, their expertise. So it's a lot of lawyers, some journalists, um, and a lot of human rights activists. So Sam, what do you think about the Facebook over, oversight board? Uh, I think I could probably uh, answer this at multiple levels. Um, I'm going to say first, when I look at this list, I know that at least three of the people are people who I deeply respect in the human rights world. So I think I can safely name them. Julia Wano, um, who leads uh, um, Internet Sans Frontières, and um, Nigat Dad from, um, from Pakistan are two incredible um, human rights activists, very grounded. So when I looked at it, I was like, there's a good list of people. Um, I don't know many of the names, and I think they've been trying to get sort of uh, a balance within the sort of conservative to liberal side within human rights. But the list of names is good. I, I, I have less concerns about who's in it than what it can actually do. <laughs> talk, talk, talk about those concerns. You definitely had a little hesitancy in your voice when I brought yeah. it. And so, so I, 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 I have an ambivalence here. Like I actually think that trying to think about outside governance is, is a useful thing. So I'm, I'm glad that Facebook invested in this. And honestly, I think they actually had a really good process of talking to people. I was in meetings where they really listened pretty intently. Um, I just worry about how they, what they're going to deal with and whether it has real impact. Um, so they're going to take these cases that are um, proposed um, uh, by Facebook or suggested coming out of uh, decisions that have been made within the Facebook team. Um, and then they're going to try and make decisions that are advisory on the organization. Yeah. The problem is we know very well, if you know tech companies, you know the really important things are building product um, and building products that actually do things in particular ways, either like content moderation algorithmically or how a live streaming app works or you know the recommendation in a YouTube algorithm. Um, and this board has no impact on product. So if the fundamental issue is that uh, an AI algorithm is taking down a particular type of content, there's no discernible link to that. It's sort of like a case by case without thinking about the structure of how this works. Um, and it doesn't appear to have any direct influence to set policy. So mm -hmm. it can't say now we've decided that in fact you should allow um, women not to feel they have to be clothed on Facebook in their upper half, like this very gender discriminatory thing that depending on context is either perceived as absolutely necessary. Other people is like, this is ludicrous. This is a particular set of you know, prudery that is imposed on some people and not on others. Um, I think it's unlikely if the Facebook Oversight Board decides that um, women can, uh, like men, sit topless on a, um, in, a, in a Facebook live feed that, um, that the policy is gonna change. Like, and it feels frivolous, but it's like a really clear example of where, you know, there's, there's a certain logic, you could make a very different policy decision. So, so on any of these ones, it's not clear to me there's influence over the underlying policy or the product design and the engineering. And right. without that influence on infrastructure, I, I, these are great people, um, smart lawyers, um, who will undoubtedly finesse this. 
The other thing is, and this has come up in the deepfakes work we do, so much of this is about the kind of digital wildfire of images being shared rapidly. And, you know, they have an impact for a day or 24 hours or 36 hours. I'm not sure what the point is, either <laughs> positively or negatively, of like two months later being able to say that should have stayed up or should have been taken down. Um, <laughs> So, so in conclusion, would you say that this is hot or not? Uh, I know Amy, I think last week you had on and she was like, she was very definitive. And I'm one of those people who's oh, always trying to split it. I'm, I'm going to say it's kind of like a lukewarm brazier, like there's stuff in there. <laughs> and there's some really hot embers in there. Like the people I know who are on the board, I consider hot embers. Like they're going to burn bright and I think they're going to do good stuff. And maybe they can push stuff to set things alight. So I'm going to hold on to these, some hot embers. Maybe it can actually set something alight. Um, but there's not a huge amount of tinder and firewood piled on top of this. Fingers crossed. Um, yeah, that, that was a really great analysis. Thank you. So um, I wanted to move on to some personal questions. So <laughs> you've been working in activism for a very long time. And you told me that as a teenager, you were, as you described yourself, an obsessive Tibet activist. And you later wrote your dissertation on 19th century Nepalese and British politics. So I am curious, I, I've always like really admired people who have picked one thing and really stuck to that one thing their entire life. Like how did you actually get into the human rights activism space and, and why has it kept you there? You're putting it very politely. Most of my friends just say I'm really annoying <laughs> because I was one of those people who was like, oh, this is what I want to do. And then I was lucky enough to be able to do it, right? Which is, you know, many people have something they want to do and they're good at and circumstances prevent them. So. I consider myself extremely lucky because I knew what I wanted to do and I'm lucky enough that I'm doing it and many people aren't. So many people are like, you're just really annoying. Um, there's something deeply annoying about that. Um, no, I came into activism through something that I have a bit of an aversion to maybe now, which is when I was, you know, well, there's family roots to it. My grandfather was a refugee from Nazi Germany, the very strong social justice tradition in my family. But um, I came into it through seeing, um, the Dalai Lama speak when I was an impressionable, you know, 13 year old. I went to Wembley Arena and saw him speak and I was blown away by him uh, personally. And then I read Aung San Suu Kyi's writings. And this is hard because Aung San Suu Kyi is definitely not my heroine or my hero now. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi being the, you know, the erstwhile democracy leader of Burma who's now presiding over, uh, um, you know, war crimes and a potential genocide in the north of that country. Uh, but she was tremendously persuasive as someone who made an argument for um, for standing up for what you believed in when she was writing, when she didn't have power. Um, and so I was inspired by leaders. Now, of course, my inspirations are actually generally not those big leaders. It's the community-based leaders who do the actual work. But uh, as an impressionable 13-year-old, that's what worked for me. I mean, what's incredible to me is like that the average 13 year old doesn't go to one talk and <laughs> throw, their, throw their life at, at, at a field. So, I mean, like I, I imagine, especially with human rights, it must be, it must require a lot of stamina to stay in because the, the stuff that you're dealing with can be really emotionally taxing and overwhelming. So like, how do you have like rules that you set up in your life to, to keep yourself grounded and, and not mix your work life and with your home life too much? Hmm. Um, I, I try and I, you know, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a big discussion in activism is like this question of how do we avoid people burning out in their thirties, right? It's like this sort of martyr complex and there are reasons people burn out because of physical pressure and security risks. And, and I'm lucky in that, unlike many of my colleagues, I live in relative security. Many of my direct colleagues and the people we work with don't. Um, we also have, and this is, I think, particular in my world is like, we watch so much just horrible images. Um, often really decontextualized. So just knowing when to take a break, when to talk to people, um, and honestly, when to cry. Like I, you know, and I, I think this is a trauma symptom, um, yeah. and I don't want to over dramatize it, but knowing when to cry. I cry a lot, and I cry without guilt about things that I know are bad, and I know, um, yeah. So I don't know, and I, I don't know if that's, I'm, I'm saying the right thing in that context, but I do, and I think it's, it's really valuable to recognize how we feel about where we are in the world. Um, I also, at the moment, obviously, I'm one of the directors of an organization that's full of people dealing with this. And, you know, our guidance to our whole team in this COVID context was like, just take it easy. Step yeah. your foot off the pedal, not on the pedal, right? Just pull it back. And that's a hard thing to do when you're worried about money and you're worried about impact and everyone's like stressed out by what's going on. But um, 
it's also the long run question is like, you know, human rights abuses are getting worse. Um, I want to be doing this when I'm 85 years old. Um, so you, you do have to think about the long run and that's hard in these worlds. Yeah. The thing about crying, like I'm, I cry a ton as well. So I'm glad that you said that, but like with COVID, I've been telling people that most like 95% of the time I'm fine, but I need like one good cry a week in order to maintain the like continued resiliency and the upbeatness yep. so, right on the clock every Sunday. I'll, like <laughs> have a good cry and then I'll be like, I'm ready for Monday again. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I'm glad to hear there are others. It's, it gets very gendered. It's weird, the whole like not crying stuff, like and men and not crying. So um, all you men who are on this call, I'm hoping you're all crying <laughs> whenever you feel like it. It's, it's really important. That's some really great advice. Um, I also really want to know, and this is the last question before we go to more Q&A. Um, I really want to know about this passion project that you, you sent me. You said that you're working on writing a mystery novel set during the Crusades. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. I'm like, a, I'm a, his, a historian at heart, but I, but so I, I, I've, I've been obsessed with the Crusades, which is that such a complicated incident in our world history. Um, and so weaponized in the last 20 years, obviously by kind of the reinvention of it as part of US foreign policy. Um, but um, it's funny, my, it's, it, it's, you may have had this experience. My father uh, knows me quite well, but um, you know, also we don't spend that much time together anymore. So every Christmas I get the latest book on the Crusades because I've been interested in it since I was a kid and I read all the Crusades books. Um, and so I, 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 I know a lot about the Crusades and I've always wanted to do something that is, um, sort of takes you away from the day to day. And I find storytelling in an abstract distant context and I love mysteries. So it's been a passion project. I should say, as you noted, I have two kids uh, and I'm currently on lockdown with homeschooling and work and uh, a hubby who probably liked me out of the house and so the work on the novel is somewhat stalled because the idea that I might walk into another room and write a mystery novel set during the crusades right now is probably not a good idea um, but uh, yeah so I'm having fun occasionally doing that and I actually just weirdly discovered a book by my bedside which my father had given me and I was looking at the author's name and it's Yuval Hariri you know the very famous sapiens author and apparently he wrote his dissertation on special operations in the Middle Ages. Who would have thought? Totally bizarre. And I was like, that is so weird. How has he become a guru for the world when I've had this book by my bed for two years? And I was like, do I really want to read that dissertation book on special ops in the Middle Ages? And he wrote it. So strange things you see. That's amazing. I, it's just such a wacky, like, because everything else that, you, <laughs> that we talk about is like so human rights focused. And you were like, also, I'm writing this mystery novel. And I was like, what? <laughs> Um, so we have a question from Helen. Um, this is going back to Facebook's oversight board. If there's no influence on product or policy or infrastructure, is there only value the positive impact on Facebook's reputation? <laughs> um, I, I, I think there's more to it. Like I think there's a normative value to people making statements that might, that then Facebook is obliged to take and consider, right? So there's a difference between us outside complaining about something and the board saying something. And then Facebook probably does need to start taking into account if they repeatedly say it. So I think there will be influence. I just wish it was much more direct um, on it. And I don't think, you know, an oversight board like this is a substitution for good regulation by governments. That's government's job to regulate. Uh, Self-regulation is always a nice thing to see. Um, and codes of conduct, but there's also a very strong argument for appropriate regulation by government. So uh, again, I'm in that kind of sort of milk toasty area where I'm like, I see good things that this could work in. And as an advocate, uh, I can see how having decisions by the board that might push key things. And as I say, there are people on that board who I think are going to actually try and push on areas that um, are really important, like the way in which, you know, uh, takedowns uh, pay an excessive attention to um, Muslim content or perceived Muslim content, but don't pay enough attention to right-wing Christian extremist content or Hindu uh, extremist content, right? So like, I actually think like seeing strong statements from the board could really be drive pressure there. Um, so I want to see that, but yes, if we don't have that underlying obligation to move, that's something different. Um, yeah. 
a follow-up comment. Is that a question? I guess they can hold the pen a bit on shaping any future regulations which might prevent your bright fires getting burnt out. <laughs> Um, if there are other questions, I'll give people just a little bit more time. And in, in the meantime, I actually had another question that I, I skipped. Um, but I'm actually curious to hear more about your thoughts on the different initiatives that um, tech companies have been engaging in, like the deep fake detection challenge from Facebook. What do you actually think about those, given that we've been talking so much about, um, so much about like how when you're thinking, when the things that you create affect everyone around the world, um, it gets really complicated because different countries have completely different cultural norms and completely different political systems. Um, how, how, how useful do you think it is that Facebook and other, and Google are doing these kinds of like deep fake detection development initiatives right now? Yeah, so um, I've been knee deep in much of that because I've been part of a steering committee that was involved in governance on the deepfakes detection challenge. Um, and actually this week we have a blog post on governing detection and a blog post on governing authenticity. Um, so I'm going to also cheat and also point at those for the, the very long answer. Um, there's good things, right? Like, we, as I said, we need more money in this and we need more money for researchers. Um, the question is also, what do we do with that detection? Is that detection going to be designed in a way that it responds to the problems that people are already experiencing in the world, like gender-based violence. Is that what the data set looks like? Um, what are the data, the research results going to be incorporated into? Is it going to be incorporated into a tool that's accessible to people globally? So the questions I ask are less about whether it's a good idea for companies to produce data sets, I actually think it is, and to put money here. It's actually like, will these competitions be structured in a way that they actually respond to the, the needs and the potential good uses and misuses globally. Um, with detection, I'm less worried about the misuses. I'm actually more worried about the accessibility, the explainability um, challenges. And then the things that we've heard pretty consistently. So, you know, talking to journalists, they were like, that's great, they're gonna build detection tools. Is someone gonna provide training for me on how to do this, uh, hire a staff person to help me do this? You know, in the absence of the resourcing, how are we gonna do that? And that goes back to that structural question, which is like, you know, the, the tech companies have essentially cannibalized journalism in many ways. Um, how are they reinvesting in, in public service media and journalism? And, you know, so, so we can't detach different bits of tech from others. So in isolation, investment in deep fakes good, um, but needs to be thought of in the broader context of what's needed for deep fakes. And then we need to view that in the bigger context of like, what is the role of tech companies in society and what's their impact on other spaces like journalism or um, public communication? Awesome. We have two more questions and then we will let you go because we are way over time. Um, so from Laura, advice is distance learning will remain a major touch point to digital information. Who's working on curriculum to help students be more discerning about sources? Hmm. Um, you know, it's the work I really love at the moment. Um, and we've been trying to think about how we might integrate some of his approach, but also other sort of approaches into our work. Um, Mike Caulfield um, uh, in uh, University of Washington um, has a methodology called SIFT um, that is basically around kind of questioning your sources, looking in parallel, uh, that I think is a really useful framework. Um, uh, First Draft has a framework. First Draft is an organization that trains people on spotting this and disinformation, particularly news journalists. Uh, they have the SHEEP framework. My problem is I always forget acronyms. I think for 90% of the world, acronyms work great. I'm always like, what was the S for? What was the P for? Um, you know, so, but those are two good frameworks and it's actually somewhere we're really looking to invest in is like, how do you talk um, in a much more person to person way about this, particularly in communities that have had less experience with media manipulation or uh, already are very suspicious because of, you know, the way in which, you know, their voices have been silenced or rights violations have been dismissed. And the last question, any thoughts on how Tim Berners-Lee's solid project could help with the issue of both tracing provenance, determining authenticity, and providing anonymity? So I'm going to do the, the thing you're never supposed to do and say, I actually don't know what that is. What is solid? I don't know either. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jen. I feel terrible because I'm like, I clearly should know what that is. Um, can you type a really short description of it in the chat? So I... Let's... let's... Oh. It's fascinating. I haven't heard about this either. Goodness, I actually can't even, I, I'll be ashamed to say, I can't even tell from the website what it does. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, 
ah, linked. I honestly don't know without looking more closely, Jenna, but I'll check it out. Um, you know, I think um, I, what I'll recommend is we have a report that just came out called Ticks or It Didn't Happen, um, which was produced by an amazing uh, witness Mozilla fellow called Gabby Ivans. Uh, it's a pun on a British phrase like ticks or it didn't happen in ticks, which are like the check mark in America. It's not about little biting insects for the Americans. Um, and it's all about the trade-offs when we make choices about this type of authenticity infrastructure. So we took a look at 14 dilemmas. We just couldn't be decisive, a little bit like the hot or not dilemma. Um, so take a look at that. And Jen, I will look at that. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, that is the end of our show and the end of AI Talk. So Thank you so much, Sam, for joining us for the last episode. It was awesome to have you. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Karen. It was a delight to join.